And we're back on stage two for the Diana Initiative. Hello, everybody. I'm Josh again. Um, and a quick announcement for y'all. Um, don't forget to visit the Expo Hall. We have sponsors with contests and swag, community organizations you should really find out more about, and the Red Team Village with uh, five Red Team Talks going on. Um, and there are raffles happening throughout the event, though. Those should be closing out pretty soon. Um, and yeah, uh, while you still have time, go visit the Expo Hall. Um, and with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Ava. Uh, Ava Black is an open source veteran who came out as trans after burning out on tech in 2017. Uh, drawing on a lifetime of meditation practice, they are a contributing author to the book Transcending, an anthology of trans Buddhist voices. Um, but they came back to tech, uh, thankfully, and now are a member of the Kubernetes Code of Conduct Committee, a project manager, project manager for Open Enclave, and a board member of a Seattle-based nonprofit that educates and advocates for consent in all aspects of life. Please welcome Ava Black. Ooh. Hey, folks. Hi. Um, well, I was going to intro myself, but Josh did a great job of that. Um, it's easier for me to talk about tech. That's usually what I do in, in conferences. But today, I'm going to be a bit more, a bit more vulnerable and talk about myself. Um, I wish I didn't feel the need to talk about gender discrimination or, or trans issues in 2020, but I kind of do. Um, and like, like a lot of other folks yesterday and today have already talked about diversity and inclusion in company, diverse and inclusive companies just perform better. Um, so the original title you can see, but I kind of changed it a bit. This talk's really more of a, of a personal story and journey. So I hope that through the experience of, of seeing me a little bit more, you learn to see other people um, and have more compassion and that, that compassion helps you shape or helps shape the technology you and the companies you work in build. Now this, this talk could start anywhere in my life, but I want to give you a little extra background on me. Um, so if I don't talk about too much, my early childhood was spent in Indian communities. My first exposure to American culture was second grade and I really didn't fit in. In, uh, in today's terms, I probably would have been labeled neurodivergent and genderqueer instead of all the other labels that were used back in the, in the 80s. So I went through primary and secondary, secondary school as fast as I could. I was um, lucky enough to get through college pretty quick and jump into a startup uh, the first, during the first dot-com bubble. I was still a teenager, a long-haired, eyeliner-wearing goth who kept odd hours and wrote angsty poetry, and I loved Linux back in the 90s. I mean, I really didn't fit in in the tech industry back then. I bounced through some startups and back to university and back to startups, and then eventually I fled California. And really, um, so in 2011, I was kind of living off grid, doing database consulting, and a friend convinced me to go to Burning Man. And if you've never been, it is exactly as hedonistic as you might have heard, disproportionately filled with tech bros who party without a care in the world. And it's also completely different from that. It can be a safe space for vulnerable uh, self-discovery for a lot of people, full of compassion and self-expression and beautiful art where queer and trans folk find a safe space unlike anything in the, in the default world. It is all of that, and ironically, it's where I learned how to act like a tech bro. The burn gave me a chance to learn about a culture I had never felt safe in growing up, men arguing with each other. I learned that if I spoke over others, my point would be heard. If I used rhetoric, I could convince the whole group that I was right, and that if I kept showing up and I kept stating my opinion, Sooner or later, there wouldn't be any opposition left. And I learned how leadership can emerge from open conflict. You just need to be perceived by the group as somebody important, someone the current leaders are willing to treat with respect. And then your opinion carries more weight. Now, to be clear, I think these are toxic norms. They don't represent the ideals of Burning Man, nor do they represent my ideals. But for a couple of years, I thought this was just how business gets done. And I came back from the burn with a completely different approach to work. Um, within a year, I started a new open source project. I was flying all over the world, talking at conferences, partying with customers, meeting clients. It's like I had just found easy mode. And I got promoted. And I got promoted again. And then two years later, I was up for another promotion. And instead of staying there, I, I spun out to a startup. Um, someone offered me the role of VP, running the whole, like, the whole engineering wing. In hindsight, I was really unqualified. Um, but as is typical for someone who was perceived as a man, 
I was hired based on what someone thought I could do, even though I'd never done it before. And so in those five years, my income more than doubled. But I didn't, I didn't really stop. I was flying, flying everywhere too much. I didn't stop to think about this, but I began to track little discrepancies. How differently men would respond to my emails before and after they heard my voice on a phone. Because to most Americans, my name back then, even back then, it was feminine. So while I was VP of engineering, my CEO tasked me with building an unbiased hiring process. He wanted me to double the team size. He wanted me to follow the Google playbook. I'll give you a brief rundown on what, on what this looks like if, you, if you're not familiar with it, but chances are if you've interviewed anywhere in Silicon Valley or the tech industry in the past five years, you've probably run into this process from the outside. From the inside, the way it works is that someone receives a resume, uh, removes the name, removes gender markers, um, and sort of scrubs anything that might be identifiable and coordinates the interviews. The actual interviewers then write up written reports, which are, again, scrubbed of identifiers. And all those reports are collated along with scores and metrics and passed on to a committee who never meets the candidate and just judges off these reports and makes a decision. Proponents of this approach claim that decision is not biased, but I will tell you it is. Uh, the unconscious bias is hiding in plain sight in every step of that process. There's bias when the applicant writes their CV. There's bias when the screener reads it. And subtle aspects of language and word choice or schools you went to uh, prioritize or inform that person's prioritization. There's bias whenever any interviewer hears a voice or sees a face on Zoom. And all the work that companies are busy doing, I'm sorry to say, it, it just hides the bias in the system. It doesn't remove it. And going through this process, even as my CEO overruled my objections, um, it really required me to learn to see the biases each of my employees had so that I could compensate for it when making those hiring decisions. And it really forced me to analyze my own biases. And so there I was studying bias in hiring and studying bias in machine learning and reevaluating a year of my own management decisions and at the same time, noticing how my list of queer friends in my community had kind of shrunk. And I realized one day that even my own primary partner thought of me as a man, and like a manly man. And sure, I lived on a farm, but that didn't define my gender. And I chopped wood, and that didn't define my gender. And yet I began to, to really think more deeply about how gender is this intersection and how bias plays into it. And the more I looked in the mirror of my community, the more I realized the lens I was seeing through and the lens I was seeing through, neither one of them reflected me, nor was the impact I was having the impact I wanted to have. You see, at work, I was meeting with execs from companies in South America and Middle East, markets where the company found the right product fit. I could see every day how those executives talked about women, and I knew if I came out, I couldn't do that job anymore. I had to make a choice. So I came out to my friends for my birthday. And what was he going to do? Um, everyone was awesome and supportive. And you know, one, one partner gave me a tiara. Another one gave me some beautiful jewelry. Um, the best birthday gift was the welcoming support from all of my friends. But after that party, I had to put on boy clothes again and get back on a plane and go fight with my CEO because passionate debate is how business gets done for some people. Um, I knew that I had to leave that company. It just took a little bit of time. And I, I told myself, I'll just take six months off, but let's be real, I burned out. I walked away with no idea whether I'd want to or even be able to get back into tech. And let's pause for a moment now and smell the roses because this talk gets a little bit dark and it's about to get kind of darker. And I want to talk about what I've learned about bias through that process and then in the window of a uh, sabbatical for a while. Um, I did a lot of self-reflection and therapy and navel gazing on questions like, why is my favorite color red? Um, might seem totally irrelevant, but bear with me for another minute. It's not. I was told as a kid that I was colorblind. And it's not that simple. It's about 10% of the world is labeled as colorblind, but there's actually a whole subclasses. Um, more than 10 of them for different variations of this 
um, different variations in the color cones in our eyes. People have a little different reception on their blue, red, or green, or they have none of one of those, or they have extra. Um, for me, I just don't see red as much as everybody else. The colors are shifted. Quite literally, my perception of the world is biased because it deviates from the norm. And as I thought about this, I thought, what about imagination and memory? I, I perceive these too. And without getting in yet into the structural or chemical differences between brains, I thought, well, what's in there is just a garbled pile of my own experiences. But somehow, all of those memories affect my judgment of everybody I meet today. We call this learning when it is explicit or bias when it's implicit. And there's a real time connection between our physical senses, our memories, and our impressions of people. When I imagine a rose, it doesn't bring up the smell, or, uh, the, the memory of my grandmother. But whenever I smell a rose, it always does. And that momentary flashback is going to impact my perception, my impression of, of a moment in time or a person who's wearing rose-scented perfume. So our experience of the physical world is completely unique because it is mediated by our own past. And I, I mentioned chemical state, but there's so much more going on in the body. And I don't know, I'm not always good at eating. Sometimes I forget to eat breakfast or lunch. And, in the after afternoon, every email I'm getting just seems kind of snarky. And my responses are definitely snarky. Um, and more than, like, uh, then I'll go eat lunch and I'll come back and, and look at the same email and I've learned not to send my responses right away. Um, you ever do that? You realize that, like, it's, it's really just my body kind of making me grumpy right now. So more than just how I respond, it actually affects how I perceive the world. If I'm walking by a rose and I'm upset or hungry, that rose isn't going to smell as good. If I'm sad, it might smell stronger. So all of this, um, all of this together is what I would call perception or perception bias. It's the sum of, our, of, of the actual sensory input, which is unique, mediated by the state of our body combined with whatever memories we have. And this framework, by the way, it isn't new. I just revisited it uh, while I was taking this this break, um, it was introduced to me as a kid through meditation. And I kept coming back to this teaching in, during, my, during my break. The act of meditation is just the act of observing our thoughts as they come and as they go, being patient about it, and not getting attached, not getting sort of caught up in those thoughts. The actual mechanism, it works to decrease the, the, the coloring, the impact of our thoughts on our perceptions just by observing them. Now, sitting on a cushion is not the same thing as meditation. That's just where we go to practice, to train our mental muscle. It's kind of like a gym. Like you go to the gym to lift weights, you sit on a cushion to work out your brain. Um, and, and if meditation is increasing your anxiety, change it up, slow it down, ask for help. Right? If you were going to the gym and it hurt, you'd ask for a physical trainer to give you tips on your posture. Do the same thing with your brain. So about a year after I left that role and, and came out, uh, I started looking for work in the tech industry again. I'm like, I'll, I'll try it again. And uh, I, I thought by this point in my career, I should be past all of that exam by whiteboard theater. But I turns out I wasn't. Um, I was asked over and over again to pass the sort of panel whiteboard exams by old white men. And I, and I say old white men not to categorize people in a negative way, but to draw attention to a divide that I suddenly found myself on the other side of. Gender shouldn't matter, but it does. Um, and it is only through recognizing that we're going to be able to improve things. And I was suddenly really aware in a way I had never been before, because I was aware that they were aware and that they were uncertain of what to do about that. I would inevitably be ushered to the one single occupant bathroom somewhere on campus far away from where my interviews were happening because they didn't know how to ask or want to usher me to a, gen to a gendered bathroom. And I was, there's a type of bias called stereotype threat. 
That is the fear of reinforcing whatever biases someone else might have about us. And since I couldn't know what bias they might have had, but it was obvious that they were having some experience, um, my anxiety just filled in that gap. And things got rough for a while. So I'm going to warn you all, the next couple of minutes of this talk might get a little bit extra rough. And then it'll get happy again. I promise there is a happy ending. Um, if you don't want to hear the actual stories that I faced from some of these tech companies, go ahead and mute. I'll do a little wave uh, when I'm done, and you'll see some happy slides, a photo of DEFCON. Um, which I wish we were all at this year, but uh, yeah. And so, oh yeah, and, and names of companies and people are scrubbed from all of this. Um, one, uh, one, one colleague that I'd worked with, right, just like he was really excited that I'm, hey, Ava, you're back in tech. It's so good to hear from you. We talked on the phone for an hour. It was super clear that I could help his team grow, and I knew the tech they were using inside and out. The call ended with a really enthusiastic, yeah, our recruiter's going to reach out to you right away. And I could tell they pulled up my LinkedIn. I'd already changed uh, details up there. And suddenly a week went by, and I checked in, and I got a cold email. So, ooh. I just got a time check. I thought this was a 30 minute slot. Um, let me skip through some of these to get to the points because this kind of goes on for a while. Four companies gave me um, this sort of really weird uh, pushback. And then one company, I think I got kind of grumpy after a year of this, um, and about 30 companies. And one, one manager actually brought me in afterwards and said, look, I really want to hire you. We need your talent but I don't know how to hire someone like you. So what changed, right? I am just as skilled as I ever was. Um, I like to think I'm more compassionate than I used to be. Um, but obviously the way people perceive me has changed. Uh, but along the way, I learned so much more about myself and about InfoSec, and I wouldn't have had the chance to go to DEF CON if not for this rather extended break. Um, I landed a job at Microsoft or now running an open source project. But the real point I want to get to in the last few minutes is the internal changes. I realized my own perception bias was changing. The more negative experiences I had, the more I expected to have them. Now I have to intentionally counter that bias. And also my hormones changed everything. Everything got richer. Sounds became deeper. My imagination got clearer. I think better. I still see colors the same way, unfortunately, and I kind of like it. Um, but flowers, when I walk on the street, bring back different memories. It's really interesting how much that changes and how much I reconnected with an internal sense of self that I'd been missing for 15 years. And it's only my experience. I'm not suggesting it's universally true, but damn, estrogen has been the best antidepressant I've ever taken. It's not medical advice. Hormones are not able to... Um, but I started looking into this, and I'm going to skip some of this because I'm running low on time. I thought I had more time. Um, we are, as a society, still learning so much about how diverse our bodies are beyond a simple gender binary. This chart was published about three years ago in Scientific American. Um, represents some of the many pathways by which biology develops not just along binary lines. About 1% to 3% of the world's population falls in the middle here. And how does this all relate to technology? Machine learning is fairly easy, air quotes there. Um, creating a model that reproduces the bias present in current social, economic, or criminal justice systems is really not hard. You feed in historical data, you get back out the bias the system already had. What is really hard is not reproducing epistemic violence against marginalized groups. And that work begins in our own heart. It starts by becoming familiar with the edges of your own comfort zone, learning about other cultures, other people, other way of life, learning to value those differences. You have to see them first to be able to value them. Learning to value the diversity in human biology as our strength. Um, my advice would be, if you can, go live in a different culture. You don't have to move to a different country. That's one example. You can find other cultures in your own city. By, by living in one and embracing it for a little while, you can look back and see your own culture differently. 
and learn to see that delta. It was part of your bias before. And if you can, I kind of recommend it for everybody, practice meditation. You don't need to find a quiet mountaintop to sit on. Over time, you learn to build a quiet place inside yourself. Find a tradition or a teacher or anybody um, and stick with it. It is not easy to see yourself clearly and to understand your own biases, but it is worth it. It is the only way we improve this society and make our companies more inclusive. Thank you. So if there's still time, I'll take some questions. Otherwise, you can find me online. Ava, thank you so much for that talk. That was excellent. Um, uh, we have time for one quick question. Um, and Red asks, how do you remove your own bias when interviewing candidates? The unfortunate answer is you can't. We all are biased. All of us, all the time, it is inherent in being human. But by becoming directly aware of my bias, that is to say, how my judgment is different than the norm or different than yours, different than other people on my team, I can do my best to compensate for it. Or we can build review panels that are inclusive and welcoming and talk about that bias. And well, I don't know enough to judge that. Does someone else here know enough? For sure, getting getting feedback from other people, having other voices that, yeah, I, yeah. Thank you. Cool. Um, yeah. okay. Great. Uh, thank you so much for speaking. Again, let's have a virtual round of applause for Ava. Boop, boop. And with that, uh, I will be signing off. See you all next time.